Song of Songs, the Book of Psalms, number 27. Psalm number 27. salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. fell. Though an army shall encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war shall rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing I desire of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. Father God in heaven, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come. God, we thank you, Lord, for this privilege, this honor, and another great opportunity. Just to lift your name. Just to call on your name. Just to bless your name. God, we know that you are the great God. You're the great King. You are the light of our salvation. We have no reason to fear. You are the strength of our life. And Lord, we have no reason to be afraid. Lord, when my enemies in my foes, when my haters came unto me to eat of my flesh, Lord, you caused them to stumble and fall. Lord, when a, a camp of enemies, a, a host of armies, when a group of people have come upon me to fight against me, Lord, you bless me. And for that, Lord, we thank you this morning for another privilege. For Satan, the devil, the enemy, has tried to stop our triumph in you. Satan, the devil, Lucifer, the accuser of the brother has attempt to stop us from lifting our hands unto you. Lord, the enemy has attempted to stop us from praising and worshiping you. But God, you are almighty. God, you are all powerful. God, you are glorious. God, you are magnificent. God, you are the supreme God. God, you are the righteous judge. God, you are merciful. God, you are amazing. God, thank you for your grace. You bless us one more time. And for that, Lord, we say thank you. Lord, we thank you for blessing us again to come to the house of prayer. We thank you for blessing us again to come to the house of praise. And now, Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. Don't let our sins hinder our connection with you. Bless us, Father God, that we will reach out and touch others. That our lives will be made to different. That we will be better, Father God. That we will run and tell men, women, boys, and girls about the goodness of God and all that he has done for us. Bless this service, Lord. Come in the room and make your presence known in the room. Bless us, Father God, to humble ourselves before you. That you, Father God, will be a blessing to us. And we will be a blessing to others. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory. We ask you to keep the glory for you are glorious. We ask you to keep the glory for you are the magnificent God. We ask you to keep the glory for you are God Almighty. We thank you, Lord, for just being God. And for that we worship you. For that we praise you. For that we lift you. For that, Father God, we bless your name. We ask you, Father God, to take over the service. Lead it as only you can lead it. Guide it as only you can guide it. Move as only you can move. That lives will be made to better. And souls will be turned around. And Lord, we thank you now. We thank you for the victory. We thank you for the victory over death, hell, and the grave. We thank you for the victory, Father God, for what Jesus has already done. 
In Jesus' name we pray. The so mighty, powerful, anointed name of Jesus of Christ we pray. And we ask it all. Amen and thank God.
verses 4 and 5. Psalm number 25, verses 4 and 5. Psalm number 25. In the Old Testament, the book is Psalms. The number is 25. The verses are 4 and 5. Psalm number 25, verse number 4, and verse number 5. Psalm number 25, verses 4 through 5. When you found it, you will discover these words. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. I want to talk about God's ways of life. God's ways of life. We look at the word ways, we realize that every person in the room have their own little ways. Yes, sir. You don't believe me, just just try it and see. <laughs> Every person who's listening, every person who's available, have their own little way of doing things, therefore they have their own little ways. But I suggest to you today, you ought to try God's ways. Everybody in the room have a, a tilting point. Everybody has a point in which they will lose some of their mind. I say to you today, there are even some folk that walk around every day, 24 hours a day with their ways on. Their habits going on, their, their mode of action, as if they have to be that way. I suggest to you today, you ought to try God and try his ways. His ways are sure, his ways are settled, his ways is stable. His ways are ways that we need to count every single day. How can we get in touch with his ways? The Bible says in Psalm 139 that, that God showed his ways unto Moses in his mighty acts to the sons of men. Let me just share with you, God is looking forward to you having just ways. God wants you to have ways that are, that are like his ways. Yes, sir. Not like you want them. Not like you have established them. And some people will tell you in a minute, I'm just like my mama. <laughs> I'm just like my dad. I think it was yesterday evening that I told Sister Cora Woods, I said, now you're acting like Johnny Woods now. And you all know how, how she acts, don't you? <laughs> Any old kind of way she wants to. I mean, she has told me for now nearly 18 years, I'm going to find me another church. I'm going to find me another pastor. I'm going to leave this church because you don't like me and I don't like you. <laughs> and every now and then, those ways show up in her beloved oldest daughter. <laughs> and some people are satisfied with their ways. I've said that there are at least two people that need to start paying me, maybe three that need to start paying me to be members here because of their ways. The first one, 90 some years old, Sister Johnny Woods. The second one, almost 75 years old, Sister Ann Paul. <laughs> the third one, not even 50 yet, <laughs> Sister Katrina Whitlock. <laughs> they need to bag a dump truck up. <laughs> a dump truck from the bank. They need to bag it up every Sunday and then come by my house on Wednesday and just shift the gear and bag it up and flip the lever and dump it in my yard and in the church yard because of their ways. 
Did you notice that all of them are women? But there are some men who have some ways too. There are some men who have some ways and they carry themselves in such a way that, that they know they need change and everybody around them need change. But I suggest to you this morning that you ought to try God's ways of life. In the text, the psalmist David, yes, sir. he's writing what is known through an acrostic. David is writing from the Hebrew language in which every single verse begins, first of all, with capital letter, but every single verse identified with the Hebrew language. He's writing this letter, and it means much to him because David has messed up. Yes, sir. Is anybody in the room ever messed up? Amen. Has anybody in the room ever fallen short? Has anybody in the room ever got to the point where sin was, was what was on their agenda for morning, noon, and evening? Well, I, I volunteer to tell you today, I messed up. I volunteer to tell you today, I've fallen short. I, I volunteer to tell you today that I missed the mark. So the psalmist David has messed up. He has missed the mark. He has fallen short. David, not only, see, some of us know David as the one who was, was caught in adultery with Bathsheba. Yes, sir. But David didn't just mess up with Bathsheba. David messed up on the war field. David's hands were bloody with the death and the blood of many men. Yeah. He had fallen short. He's messed up. But the good thing about David, he knew how to get back to God. <laughs> He knew how to run to God when he messed up. The problem with many of us today, we don't know how to get back to God. We don't know how to, how to say, God, I'm sorry. God, please forgive me. God, I've fallen short. If you're going to hide it from anybody, you ought not be hiding it from God simply because God already knows. <laughs> He knows your problem. He knows your sin. He knows your, your, your complaints. He, he knows your rising up. He knows your sitting down. He knows what you think before you say it. God already knows you. He just wants a right fellowship with you, so you might as well come to him and say, Lord, I messed up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And don't act like you don't know what you did. Call it out before God. And tell God, God, I messed up. So the psalmist David is in the midst of prayer, meaning that he's having a conversation with God. And when you pray, you ought to have a conversation with God. It ought to be a dialogue. It ought to be God talking to you, and you ought to be talking to God. You ought not give God a monologue where you just lay everything at God's feet and after you get through, you just go around and, and make sure that you've given God his checklist where God is now becoming your bellhop where he can do whatever you want him to do when you want him to do it. And we even pray like that. God, I need you to deliver right now. And we ought to pray like that. We ought to pray with confidence. We ought to pray with, with conceitment. We ought to pray with, a, with such much expectation until we know God can answer and God will answer. That's what David's doing. David is in prayer. He's talking to God. And he's taking God at his word. One thing that he does, he, he asks God for forgiveness. You see, we can't get to God if, if sin stands between, between us and God. So we have to ask God, God, forgive me for messing up. Forgive me for falling short. In verse number one, he says, to you, God, to you, Lord, to you, I lift up my soul. To you, he, he takes confidence in the almighty God. Where have you placed your confidence? All right. In whom have you placed your confidence? In what have you placed your confidence? And why have you placed your confidence there? David doesn't place his confidence in, in armies anymore. He doesn't place his confidence in men anymore. David places his confidence in God. Yes, sir. He's in prayer. He places his confidence in him. And because he places his confidence in him, he admits that he has messed up. He's fallen short. Yes, sir. 
He picks this thought up again in Psalm 51. He says, restore to me the right salvation. Restore to me, Lord, my, the feeling I used to have toward you. Restore to me the fellowship that we once had. Let me just put a pin right here and let you know that, that your Christianity ought not be in a feeling. Your Christianity ought not be in your blessings. Because some people feel like it this morning. You felt like it this morning. You may not have felt like it when you got up this morning, but you felt like it this morning. How you know I felt like a preacher because you're here? And some people felt like being here on time. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You felt like it. You felt like it. And some of you didn't feel like you're not the bad this morning, but God auctioned you in, and now you're here. And because of God's auctioning power, you're here. So your Christianity ought not be in a feeling. It, not, it ought not be in your blessings and how God keeps right on blessing me and God keeps answering my prayer. Your Christianity not, should not be based on your blessings. Your Christianity ought to be based on, based on who God is. Not just on what God does. That's why we come and we lift our hands, we, we do our dance, we sing our song, we, we worship him, we, we tell God how magnificent he is because we honor him for who he is and not just what he has done. It's a sad day when you only honor God for what he can do for you. Right. Haven't he done enough? The old saints back home would say, if God does nothing else for him, he has done enough. If God doesn't give you another job, he's done enough. If he doesn't give you another degree, he's done enough. If God doesn't even keep your health, he has done enough. For us to raise our hands early in the morning and say, Lord, I thank you. Before you get out of the bed, you ought to say, God, I praise you. When your eyes fly wide open, you ought to say, God, I thank you for another day. Another day that you have granted me that I did not deserve. We walk around and act like we deserve to be here. We act like we we ought to we ought to we ought to be stepping out of a cloud because we just been so holy. Well, first of all, if you think you're that holy, that's sin in itself. <laughs> one, one, one person writes writes a letter and, and that person begins this letter by saying, I am the humble one. And then that person says, I am the wise humble one. Now, first of all, it's messed up when you got to tell folk you're the humble one. Secondly, it's messed up when you got to tell folk that you are wise because they are see, first of all, they already see that you're not wise because you have to call yourself humble and you have to call yourself wise. There's none wise but one. So, David, in his prayer, asked the Lord to forgive him. And in your quiet time, go ahead and read the whole number of the 25th Psalm because David says, Lord, remember your tender mercies. Yes, right. David says, Lord, I, I know, I, I know I messed up, I know I've fallen short, but God have mercy on me. Yeah. You see, God's tender mercies is when God chooses not to give you the bad, to reward you for the bad that you deserve, the bad that you've done, God has held back the judgment. He's held back the sinners. He has given you mercy. Yeah, yeah. Let me just tell you, everybody in the room, everybody that's listening, you, you have mercy this morning. Yeah. How you know I got mercy? Because you're still here and you don't deserve to be here because you committed enough sin in your childhood to be sleeping in your grave. Oh, That's why I can't say God give me a second chance because God keeps giving me another chance. I burned up my second chance the moment the doctor packed me on my tutu and I began, I began to cry. And, my, and he told the doctor, he said to the doctor, he, the doctor said to my parents, it's a boy. Let me tell you, I wore out my second chance right then and there. Because the Bible teaches I was born in sin. I was shaping in iniquity. I have fallen short. I have messed up. I have sinned. I've done the wrong thing. I have missed the mark. And if you was honest, you would admit that you missed the mark also. So the, so the psalmist David said, Lord, forgive me. He says, whatever you do, remember your tender mercies. 
I'm going to tell you, when you mess up, you need to remind God of his tender mercy. And then he says, God, remember your loving kindness. He's reminding God of God's character. You see, God is a merciful God. He is the merciful God. He is a, a loving, kind God. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he is. He, he is merciful. He is kind. He is kind because he's given us breath to breathe. He's kind because our heart is yet pumping blood to every extremity of our body. The psalmist says, the psalmist says, in Psalm 25, the psalmist declares, Lord, don't forget, don't forget me because of my sins of old. You see, there are some sins that you committed in your young age that, that you want God to forget about. There's some things that I've done in, in my foolish days when I was climbing fool's hill. Anybody in here been ever climbed fool's hill? Anybody in here ever ever just wrapped around Fool's Hill? Anybody here climbed Fool's Mountain? And we act like our children are the only ones that have climbed the hill of foolishness. When we grew up, we didn't have internet, but we were acting fools. I mean, plump fool, they would say back home. I mean, a plump, well, why are you acting a plump fool? Making decisions that there were bad decisions. Hanging out with folk that were the wrong folk. Doing things that were the wrong things. And David says in Psalm 25, David says, Lord, please, please, Lord, don't hold my foolish sins against me from my childhood, from my youth. This Lord that he's talking to is, is Jehovah God. The self-existing God. He is God and Anathia. It's in all caps. It's, it's, in, it's in all bold letters. He's talking to the Lord Ananias. In other words, he's the God that was here before he got here. He was the God before existence existed. He was the God before Adam and Eve showed up. He's the self-existing God. No one voted him in as God. No one legislated him to be God. No one selected him as God. No one made him God. He just is God. And in the future, he will always be God. He's the self-existing God. He's the God that exists before anything happened. He, he's the God that stood out on the balcony of nowhere, in the midst of nothing, in the midst of darkness, and, and said, let there be light. He didn't have to, oh, turn the switch on. He just spoke it, and light came skipping down and around through the universe. He's God. Now, who wouldn't serve a God like that? Who, who wouldn't serve a God like that? Who, who wouldn't serve a God that's a self-existing God? He says, he says, God, I trust you. God, I, I trust you. When he moves from verse 1 to verse 2, he calls him Lord, the self-existing God, in verse 1. In verse 2, he says, oh my God. This form of God is Elohim. This Elohim God, it, it, it is used many times for many God, but this God that we're talking about, the God that we serve, is the almighty God himself. He is the supreme judge. And, and you get upset when they say, all right, the honorable judge X, Y, and Z is presiding. I remember, I remember, I was, I was in a particular church, and I was the evangelism minister there. And the pastor and I, and it wasn't Homer Street, so the pastor and I, your, your brain already moving. <laughs> the pastor and I went down the court to try to save the young lady from going to jail. And the bailiff stood up before the judge showed up, and he said, "Everybody, be quiet." So I started writing notes to the pastor sitting next to me. I wrote a note that said, his mama must have dropped him on his head. He got such a bad attitude. I said, he must got up on the wrong side of the bed. Otherwise, the pastor looked at me and said, stop writing me notes before he subpoena your notes and we both go to prison. He was 
was so afraid of the judge and so afraid of the bailiff until we are quiet, he was scared to me to even pass him a note. We are more respectful to those in the local courtroom than we are to the almighty supreme God, the Elohim God, the self-existing God, the supreme judge himself. We ought to honor this God. He says, I lift up my soul. This word lift means I respect you. I yield to you. I bear my forgiveness in you. So when he talks about lift, he, he's saying to, to God, he's saying, God, here I am. And let me just remind you, if you're going to come before God, you might as well come clean. If you're going to come before God, you might as well tell God all about it. You can't go to counseling and get counsel until you put it all on the table. You got to put the good, the bad, and the ugly on the table. Some, some folk come to counseling, and when they show up, I already know, man, this is going to go nowhere. Because somebody is going to keep a secret. Somebody's not going to tell the truth. Somebody's trying to make themselves look good. And so counseling is no good unless you give it all to God and lay it all on the table. And when you lay it all on the table, you need to understand anyway, the counselor himself, the judge himself already knows all about you. That's why, that's why you shouldn't be walking around telling everybody your business. Amen. Because we got Twitter now. <laughs> we got text and Facebook now. We, we, we got Yahoo and we got o, o -A -L, AOL now. We, we got Comcast.com. We, we got .net right now. Let me just share with you. If you're going to trust somebody with your business, you better trust that unto the Almighty God. I've watched Sister Henry over the last 18 years. She want to know yours, but she ain't going to tell you hers. She going to keep it all to herself. I mean, she going to know, where were you last Sunday? And, and where you been? And, and why I haven't seen you? But you ask her that, but it's like you have stumped her toe. And she'll get real spiritual on you in a heartbeat, Brother Urban. And she'll say, I take my troubles to the Lord. And I leave them back. <laughs> I'm telling you that you can trust God with your business. <laughs> you, you, you can trust God. You, it, it, the, the psalmist says in verse number two, oh my God, I trust you. Let me not be ashamed. This, this word, be, he says he, he, he trusts him with his soul. His soul is his innermost being, his very person. He trusts God. Can you trust God with your very most being? Your very most inner thoughts, your, your, the inner part of you, the, the thing that really makes you up. He said, trust God. He said, I lift up my whole soul to you and I trust you. Y'all just be lying to your spouses. <laughs> oh, baby, I can tell you anything and I ain't got to worry about it. And don't let you be dating somebody. If you're dating somebody, or you lay up all night long on the telephone lying to them, talking about, oh, I just trust you so much. But you understand, don't you? They mean well when they get your business. They mean to keep it to themselves. But all of a sudden, one day, they, they get with their BFF. They get with their very best friend. They, they get with their other associate, and they've already told you that you are their BFF. And all of a sudden, it just slips. And in the church, is the world worth? This is how church folks do it. They say, they say stuff like this, Brother Carter. I don't gossip. I don't mean to gossip. I'm not a gospel bud. <laughs> and if they don't say it that way, they'll say, Oh, girl, please pray for him, his daughter, his son. Please pray. You know, they, they clam. Oh, please pray. That's, that's gossip. If God has laid it at your, your doorstep to pray for somebody, you ought to spend your time praying for them and not spread it all over the neighborhood. But the psalmist said, I trust God. And he said, God, whatever you do, whatever you do, God, I know I've sinned, but don't make me ashamed. Yes, sir. The psalmist declares that and he didn't want to be ashamed. He, he, he trusts God so much so until he has his hope in God. 
He has his confidence in God and he's sure about God. He said, don't make me ashamed. Don't disappoint me, God. In other words, God, my sin is disappointing enough. Our sins disappoint God. Our sins separate us from God. Our sin mess us up. And no one in the room can say they haven't sinned. And not only have we sinned, we have sinned both by omission and commission. We've sinned intentionally. And some of us have been walking to sin and telling God, God forgive me for this, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> Take four. God forgive me. God, please, please forgive me for this one. But I just got to tell her a piece of my mind. <laughs> the Negro College father said, it's a, it's a terrible thing to lose a piece of your mind. It's a terrible thing. To Don't concentrate on, consecrate on telling somebody your mind or giving them a piece of your mind because your mind is a terrible thing to waste. Right. Always stay focused on what God is doing. Stay focused on how God is, is using you and blessing you. If God has not gotten to you yet with your blessing, hold on and wait on him. The psalmist declares in verse number two, let not my enemies triumph over me, Lord. Let not my enemies, this word triumph means to rejoice, to, to jump for joy. Don't let my enemies celebrate for, for what they're doing to me. My enemies, let me tell you something. The devil is celebrating not only at the United States of America, but the devil has a foothold, a toehold, an arm and a leg on the state of Texas. Every single time we're in the news, we make the news every single week, three and four times a week. And none of it, none of it is for good. None of it, none of it, and none of it, none of it is for good. I mean, we have the state of Texas is it's the biggest state in the first 48. It is making the biggest mess of the United States. Every single time, every single time, we, 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 we ought to be ashamed of ourselves. But when you do not have God, and you're not led by God, and your constitution is not of God, you can't expect that person to do anything like have a godly way. I'm, gonna talk, I'm talking about the ways of life. God's ways of life. Men will do anything to get ahead. To get a vote in. To stay in office. To gain power. To get a dollar here and there. I always wonder. Now let me just tell you. This is just, just me. I'm just thinking now. I'm just thinking now. Maybe you haven't thought about it. The, the, the state representatives get $7,200. It may have gone up, but this is about two years ago. The state representatives get $7,200 for representing us a year. Why all of them rich? I'm just, I'm just saying, I'm just asking. I, I'm, I'm just asking the question. I mean, why, why all of them, all of them? I know they got law practices. I know they got other, other things, but check this out. We will glorify, we will itemize, itemize uh, those who play sports, those who sing, those who are state representatives, and we want them to drive the best, live in the best, we don't complain about it. But let a preacher get a new ride. If a preacher get a new ride, he got to be stealing the church money. Let me just turn notice today. Let me just let you bless you. Let me just let you know today. At the New Beginning Missionary Baptist Church, 4251 Shiramai Road, Houston, Texas, 77048 USA. This preacher ain't selling no money. That, that wasn't good English for you. I'm not stealing any money. And you can take it to court, you can, you can, you can move around. I, because guess what? If I worked 40 years, and Sister Davis worked 40 years, that's a total of 80 years. If we can't buy a house, if we can't buy a car, shame on us. We messed up our lives. We ought to be living under the bridge. But if LeBron James can drive what he want to drive, I ought to be able to drive what I want to drive. Because it belongs to the Lord. And he has made me steward. Just because you're not a good steward over what the Lord has blessed you with, don't hate on me. 
I sacrificed. I told Sister David, no, we can't get that. I said, Sister David, no, we need to put this aside. And now in our senior's age, we ought to be able to live on what we put aside. Good God of mine. You can say all you can't say amen. So the psalmist says, don't, don't make me ashamed. Don't let those who deal treacherous with me be victorious. When he used the word enemies, he's talking about his adversaries. He's talking about his foes. And believe it or not, see the children these days think they're coming up with new words. This word, this, this, this word enemies in the original Hebrew word, it means haters. We, we, thought, we thought back in the 90s that when we walked around saying, shake the haters off, we, was, we thought we had come up with something. But the Hebrew writer had already said, your enemies are your haters. Your enemies are those who, who triumph over you. Your enemies are those who suppress you. The enemies are those who, who, who refuse to support you, but they oppress you. You see, I know what oppression means. I, I grew up in Mississippi on a plantation. I know what oppression means. <laughs> I know what oppression means really good. I mean, we live so far in the country, you couldn't see your hand at night in front of you. Y'all say y'all had to go in by the time the street light came on. We didn't have a street light. Sometimes we have to use coal. Mm, yeah. We're wicked. Yeah, right. And children complain because they don't have all this stuff to get their education with. Let me tell you, I had a lantern. Right. And the lantern had to burn all night long. Yeah. That's what it means when they say you're burning the midnight oil. You have to burn the midnight oil to make it. I'm so proud. I'm so glad about the report cards from our, ch our children this, this six weeks and this nine weeks. I, just, I can just stand up, throw my hands up, and holler. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. A, B, J, B, J, B, A, A, A. I'm so proud of our young people. Because they're using what they have, and they don't have excuses, so they don't make excuses. And mom and daddy, y'all need to stop granting them excuses. Well, she may not be able to do that. He may not be able to handle that because, you know, I couldn't do it. Well, that was you. Your child is smarter than you are. Your child has more resources than you have. Don't let them get by with whining and crying simply because this is a cruel, dirty world out here. And when they leave your house, they got to face a cruel and dirty world. And this world is not going to be kind to them. You got to tell them like it is. I remember going my first year, going to orientation at Mississippi Delta. I, I looked around the room. I said, wow, it's like a fly in a bowl of milk here. I was the only black person in the room. I mean, the only one. Well, what do you expect? You go into the all-white college, you all see all white people, right? In Mississippi, 1981. It's not any better today in, in 2001. I went back home and I told Mama, Mama, I was the only black person in the room, and she said something that changed my life. She said to me, whatever they can do, you can do better. And that statement right there has stuck with me and has set a running track for my life ever since. Young people, whatever anybody else can do, regardless of your color, regardless of your creed, regardless of the household you came out of, you can do it better. Don't complain about the man got me down. <laughs> No one, Dr. King says, no one can hold you down. No one can hold a good man down unless they stay in the mud with him. And if you're in the mud with me, that's just a good, enough, good enough for me to sliver right out from under you. You can make it. You can do it. You can make things happen that no one else has ever made happen. That's why we have in this room, we have on this podcast, young people who are inventors who are going places and doing things because we have a God in heaven that we are looking forward to him blessing them through. That's right. That's right. Says, don't make me ashamed because of my trespass in me. And this is where I'm at, verses four and five. 
Psalm 25, verses 4 and 5. He says, he says, in verse 3, he says that it will, they jump on him without cause. But then he goes to verse 4. He says, show me your ways, O Lord. When he says show, he means instruct me and make me to know. If you're going to get to know anything, you need to get to know it through the Lord. God has all the resources. God has all the knowledge. Young people ought to be praying, Lord, teach me. Lord, show me. Lord, bless me. Lord, I, I unveil myself from you, Lord. Lord, I'm asking you to show me. Teach me, instruct me. Teach me to show me your ways. Help me understand you, God. Let me tell you, some people are going through things because they are focusing more on their issues than they are on God. If you focus more on God and not on your issue, you will look up one day and God has relieved you and delivered you from your issue. The psalmist said in, in number 27 that, that God will hide me in his provision. In the secret of his tabernacle, he will hide me. God has a way of hiding us. He covers us. He keeps us when we can't keep ourselves. We can't regulate our own blood pressure. We can't regulate our own heartbeat. But God has kept us. I suppose we've been dead. I suppose we've been dead. Born with a heart condition. Born with a heart murmur. Born with this awful sound. When my heart beat, it'll go. Poof, 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 poof. And then the false prophets of the neighborhood, they don't even go to church. The false prophets. Of, you know, every neighborhood got some, Brother Dick. The false prophetess of the neighborhood said, Oh, God, with that condition, he'll never live. Past age 18. But I had a praying mom. I had a praying dad, a praying granddad, a praying grandma. And then, and, and they tried to, to keep me where I wouldn't hurt myself. But everybody else was going to the cotton field, chopping cotton. I wanted to go too. So I told dad, I said, dad, I think I can do this. He said, well, if you get out there and turn blue, you're on your own. At the age of 13, I started chopping cotton. I've been working ever since. Dad got a taste of what it's like for me to work. He wouldn't let me shut down. And then I got fired chopping cotton. Shabon, I got fired chopping. I got fired in the cotton field. I went home because I was a sickly little boy. Mama made the statement. She said, well, don't worry about it. I can take care of you. Dad said, the devil is a liar. He said, you go back out there, I don't care what it takes for you to get on that truck at 3 a.m. in the morning. When that truck moves from 19 a.m., when the truck moves, you better move. If the man won't let you on the truck, you better run behind it. You go, everything in this house going to work. Everything. He said, there's nothing. He said, I told you, daddy said real good. I ain't raising no sisters in this house. There was another word out there then. I'm just kind of cleaning it up. That's, he ain't raising none of them in his house. And so we need to understand that we need to be taught God's path. God has a pathway for our children. God has a pathway for us as adults. We need to be shown that way. We must be shown that way. Oh, Lord, teach me your path. You want God to teach you your path. You want God. You want the Lord to teach. This word path is a, a trodden road. This word path is a highway. This word path is your GPS. Somebody used GPS to get here this morning. And some of you rely on GPS so much, it'll run you right in the ditch, right in the, right in the ocean, and you just keep driving. You float, and you say, what about the GPS says? Turn right. We want God to be our GPS. We want God to lead, guide, and direct us. We want God to teach us his path. Teach us his highway. This word lead. Verse number five, we want God to lead us. This word lead comes with the idea of a bow and an arrow. It is where the archer takes his bull and he strings it and he tightens it on both ends 
until the bow is bowed until the arrow can be pulled back in the string and it will hit its target. We want God to lead us in a way where we won't miss out on life. Young men are missing out on life because they want to be like everybody else. Every time I see a young man with his britches on the ground, britches on the ground, getting looking like a fool with his britches on the ground, he want to be like somebody else. He doesn't have a belt on. He doesn't have pants that fit. His britches on the ground. Girls, you ought to pass by him and never look at him again. Because he can't lead you. He can't guide you because he's a follower. He's acting like everybody else. When my daughter was in high school, boy came over one day and he was about to sit down. I said, hold up. Sit on the floor. I said, man, you jive and they said, no, sit on the floor. Yeah. Why do I have to sit on the floor, Mr. Davis? Because you, you ain't gonna put your nasty underwear that's been shown to everybody all day long on a couch where my wife and my daughter lay their head. No, sit on the floor. You can come in with your britches down if you want to. You will not have a seat. You got the floor. And when you leave, I'm gonna spread with awesome, back me up, and I'm gonna I'm gonna wash it down and soak it down. Don't nobody wanna see your nasty underwear. And then you got big old grown men, 40, 50 years old. Walk around like thugs and talking about, oh, I can't find me a job nowhere. You right, I wouldn't hide you either. <laughs> we have to get to a point in our lives where we obey God. And we act like we're godly people. We act like we're people who love the Lord. When we love the Lord, we act like we love him. We dress like we love him. We think like, like we love him. We want God to show us his ways. See, the problem with many is that we want the actions of God, but we don't want the ways of God. We want him to lead us. We want him, this word, we want him to lead us into all truth. This word truth, it, it means trustworthiness in that way which is right. Do you want to be right or you just want to be you? There used to be a member of New Beginning Church. Thank God that's not a member anymore. I used to be a member of New Beginning Church that would boldly say to, to everybody else and me, this is just who I am. You got to accept me the way I am. I said, that's just as ghetto. That's just ungodly. That's just trifling. That is just not of God at all. That's so satanic. What you just told me, and you also told God, is that I'm not willing to grow past where I am today. You got to accept me who I am, and when I show up next Sunday, I'm going to be the same way I used to be. Trifling. Ungodly. Doing the same thing over and over again and don't want to change. I am. I get it my way. Well, you do. You go with Frank Sinatra. I don't want you around me, because I'm going to do it God's way says, God, whatever you do, lead me in your truth. Teach me, instruct me, give me a skill, give me a knowledge, teach me, for you are my God, you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. He says, God, I need you to teach me. I need you to instruct me. I need you, God, to bless me because you're my God. Again, this is the supreme God, the almighty God. He is the one who is the supreme judge. He says, you're the one who is my salvation. You, you're the one who, you God is my salvation. This word salvation means deliverance, means safety. The word salvation means you are my liberty, my prosperity and saving power. There's no one who can save you like God can. We, we put our hope in the legislature. We, we put our hope into who's the governor in charge. Let me tell you, the governor, in this United, the governor of the state of Texas, of the United States, is running this state in the ground. And he's deliberately doing it. He's doing it. 
doing it for real. But the God we serve, and Brother Miles made it clear, the God we serve is not sleep. The God we serve is watching. And when he, when he, when he delivers us, he's going to deliver us in the presence of all who see him doing wrong now. When God shut it down, God showed him. Two years ago, God showed him. I shut this whole world down. What did God do? Shut the whole world down. I mean, everything was on lockdown. In India, there, there were folk going to church. They were singing the church. There were police officers waiting out door with a long stick. And as they came out of church, they beat them. And he, they wanted them to know that everything is shut down. When God shut it down, he gets everybody's attention. Even the people in the villages in the bush company, the bush, bush company, they know. In the villages, they know. If they didn't know before, they now know who God is. God shut it down. You know, we used to having to talk with our children because you're children of color, we have to talk. And we shift from having to talk to our children, from shift from having to talk about police officers to our children, to shift to talking to our children about the virus. Don't go over that house. Don't leave this house. Wear your mask. Make sure you don't come within six feet of anybody. When you talk to somebody, you make sure if they don't have their mask on, give them 10 feet. Make sure that you stay clean. What, I mean, there have been, there have been so, many, so many clean households in the last 18 months. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> Dirty folk cleaning their house. God has gotten our attention. And if we're going to be delivered, it's going to take God, the same God that shut it down, it's going to take the same God to open it back up. By the time we think we've got this under control, another strain pop up. And then we begin to watch news. It ain't hit Houston yet. It, it hadn't hit State of Texas yet. And while we're talking, it's already entering. All right. God is in control, people. Yes, sir. The psalmist declares, God, you are my salvation. Yes. You're the one who keeps me. You're the one who gives me prosperity. We've been watching prosperity preachers for 30, 40, 50 years. And these prosperity preachers been taking folk money by the tons. And people, as long as you got a coliseum with people and you saying you're going to be blessed, be, be blessed, be blessed, folk just forking out money. Prosperity preachers. I have a problem with that. The reason why I have a problem with it, if the only person getting blessed is the person that's talking, there's a problem. If the blessings are not trickling down from God, then that's a problem. Matter of fact, your blessings don't have to come through the man of God. If you got connection with God, your blessings ought to come from God straight to you. And you got guys telling you, well, if you come hear me at the Coliseum, know what? God shut the Coliseum down. I don't know what they're doing now. They're probably jumping off bridges. <laughs> Talk about you got to come. So they, they thrive of prosperity and now they don't have the people in front of them. I don't know what they're doing now. The Bible says this word salvation is prosperity. The psalmist declares that the only person that can give you prosperity is this God. The supreme God. The, the great I am God. And finally the psalmist says I'm going to wait. And I'm going to wait all day long. We want it now. We, we got microwaves now. We got cars that drive all two, 200 miles an hour. We want it right now. Folks that's going to get married, women are telling, telling guys now, look, I'm 30. It's time for you to do this now. We want it right now. Ashley, don't get in a hurry. Ashley, hold on, baby. Wait on the Lord. Because he walks with both legs. Don't choose him. Hold on, honey. Because he talks so sweet and tell you, girl, I like how you look. Hold on, baby. Hold on. The psalmist says, I'm not only going to wait, I'm going to wait all day long. And when you wait on the Lord all day long, he, can, he knows where you are. He knows where to find you. And he knows how to bless you. So wait on it. Wait on it. Because Isaiah says that they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. 
They will mount up with wings of eagles. They shall walk and not faint. You won't give up when you wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord because if he's not here now, he's right around the corner. He's there. Some say, I'm going to wait on him. And when you look at this, this phrase all day long, it means in the Hebrew, I'm going to wait till he gets here. If there's no time with God. You say a minute is a thousand years in the sight of God. You just wait on him. And when they ask you, what are you doing? Tell them I'm waiting on the Lord. <laughs> when they tell you, you don't need to wait that long. You've been waiting long enough. Just wait on the Lord. People, people have reached out and got stuff and reached out and got people, reached out and got things. And if the Lord gives you, the Lord can keep it. If you went and got it on your own, you're going to lose it. Wait on the Lord. The psalmist says, I'm going to wait on him all the day long. You see, this world had to wait on the Lord. Matthew says, and I know some of y'all are in your Bible listening now, so you've already covered that part of Matthew. Matthew says that Jesus came down through 42 generations. He came 14 years and, and 14 years and, and 14 years in Matthew chapter 1. He came down through 14 gener 42 generations. And we had to wait on him. Moses couldn't do it. Noah couldn't save us. Abraham couldn't make it. We had to wait on the Lord. He came down through 42 generations. He got off in a place called Bethlehem of Judea. He did, I tell you. His name is Jesus, the righteous son of God. He died on Calvary's cross. They killed him. They nailed him. They ribbed him. He died on Calvary's hill. Oh, they took him off the cross. <laughs> I said they took him off the cross. They took my Lord and your God. They took him off the cross. Laid him in a barber tomb. It was a barber tomb, I tell you. It was Joseph's brand new tomb. He waited there all night Friday night. All night Saturday night. All of that Thursday morning. He got up with all power. He got up with all power. All power in heaven and earth. It is him. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. He's the one who's sitting on the right hand of the Father. And every time I confess my sins, every time I remind God I messed up, Jesus pleads my case. He, he intercedes for me. That same Jesus is going to catch a cloud one day. He's going to catch a cloud one day. And when he catches a cloud, at the top of God, the dead in Christ that died, they will be resurrected from the dead. And those of us who remain will be caught up with him in midair. The Bible says we will forever be with the Lord. Wait just a little while now to forever be with the Lord. Good evening, boys. If I don't see you anymore, I may be on the other side where there's, a, there's no more weeping. There's no more crying. There's no more complaining. There's no more pain. No more suffering. No more arthritis. I'll be on the other side celebrating with the Lord. The Bible declares we will forever be with him. In the meantime, I'm just waiting. <laughs> In the meantime, I'm just waiting. I, I'm just waiting on the Lord. I'm waiting. Every time I listen to Trump, I'm waiting. Every time I listen to Abbott, I'm waiting. Every time I see abortionists, I'm waiting. Every time I see same-sex marriage, I'm waiting. One of these old days, he's going to crack the sky. My waiting days will be over. I'm going over yonder to see the king. The door of the church is open. The invitation is accepted. You ought to come to Jesus. The door is open. Just as you are. Come to Jesus. Jesus is waiting. The Holy Spirit says come. Jesus says come. God the Father says come. The door is open. If you trust Jesus as your personal Savior, you can celebrate with us on the other side. If you're here today and you 
has favored you, God has blessed you. So in honor of, of breast cancer, every year we give, in honor of breast cancer awareness, every year we give a donation uh, to the Rose. The Rose is uh, a group that, that makes sure that women can get their mammograms. Those of you who have insurance, go to the Rose to get your mammogram, and then you will be able to sponsor other women to get theirs. So uh, at the end of, of this month, the, we've invited the Rose back again, so at the end of this month, they will be here on, on October the 31st. But on October the 30th, uh, we will have a day in the park right here at Tom Bass Park. We'll have a day in the park to help raise money for the Rose. And it's, it will be a 10K walk, run, and ride. It's a 10K walk, run, and cycling. So if you don't have a bike, you still need to show up. If you're in a wheelchair, get somebody to push you so you can ride. It's a 10K. I, I won't even tell you how long 10K is. Somebody already have their calculator out. Somebody always, Sister Carter, 10K. 10K, Sister Carter, don't teach Hazel on excuses now, Sister Carter. It's a 10K, Sister Carter. It's a 10K. And if you're just totally unable to make it, we want you to sponsor those of us who will be cycling, those who will be running, and those, of, uh, those who will be walking. So we want you to be a part of that day. It's October the 30th, and Sister Arlene will be leading the pack that day. So if you want to put your bikes on, she'll take it easy on you for that day. So meet us in Tom Bass Park at 7 a.m. You can't get up at 7 a.m. You can't get there at 7 a.m. You have to be there at 7 a.m. October 30th, uh, we're going to join the roads and walking, running, and cycling. And we want to raise a lot of money because there's somebody in your family that's been impacted or dare say going to be impacted by best cancer. If you can't walk, you can't run, you can't cycle, come on out there and show your support and bring some money. We want to make sure that it's a big day. And then when they come on the 31st, the following day, our church will always give them an offering because we want women and men. Don't you know that men have breast cancer or chest cancer? We want women and men to know that we are supportive of what you're going through in this day and this time. Amen? So please, ma'am, put on your calendar. October the 30th, October the 30th, we will have Breast Cancer Health Care Day. And all this month, we have Breast Cancer Awareness here at our church. So I know some of you have it on your peak, and, and we want to make sure that we make people aware that we want cancer to go back to hell where it came from. Just like we want COVID to go back to hell where it came from. So we want to stamp out, stamp out cancer. And early detection is one way to help stamp it out. So we want to support the roads. Why don't you stand to be dismissed?
for others to hear, for others to see. Bless our broadcast and all those who are on it. We thank you, Lord, for Sister Arlene Wade. We thank you for 100 years of service unto you, Lord. 100 years of being on earth. We ask you to keep us strong. Bless her mind. Bless her physiology. Bless her, Father God, that she will walk with you. Now, Lord, we ask you to keep us focused on Jesus, regardless of what this week offers. Bless us, Father God, to ever look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling. Unto him, the only wise and only true God. Unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us all say. Uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, In I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. God bless you and God keep you. John 12 and 32.